Olive Garden, Raffinelli, Lola Judd up against the barriers. Uh, he had a quick shot of the team, and I don't know if he hit the barriers or if he pulled off just uh, a little no, too he far. Didn't, he didn't pull off. They wouldn't be they pulling him, like yeah. that. They got the cable down. It looks like he went off of that left-hander. It's a Ouch. tricky left-hander. Oh, the West. Little, yeah. It's one of the most difficult corners out here, or the trickiest, I should say. Yep. And he went off, and uh, I drove for Raffinelli with the BMWs in 96. Great guy. Uh, he runs a really good team, and that's and that's a small budget operation compared to what we're seeing. Yeah, they're doing very well. It's not all over yet, though. But you're quite no, right. But, but luckily, that is right back just past the just before the entrance to the pit. So if they can get a tow or get a push back, it's not very far for that's them right. to get to work on the car and get it back out there. That's By right. the way, his sister has the best meals in the paddock. She cooks like <laughs> you can't believe. And Danny and I went around there to get a feed earlier on tonight. And she hadn't started up yet. And now we're working. And if they go out, I don't want that olive garden and, car and to go would, out. But you wouldn't have brought one back for me either, would you? I'd have brought you back a piece of pizza. Hey. But hey, I'm really worried, because if that car goes out the race, she may decide not to cook. And hey, Danny, what are we going to have for dinner? Uh, she always cooks. <laughs> oh, she's she does? She's great. OK. She's great. Good. Well, that's where we're going to be headed when we're finished. Well, that's a good plan. Uh, indeed, it's some uh, great food. Well, look at uh, that the is artistry not a, of motorsports is something yeah. else. And that is not an olive leaf. <laughs> it has nothing to do with the Olive Garden. You know, I really admire Al Raffinelli because he's, he's doing the same sort of thing I'd love to do. It's where you take hold of a really tasty chassis like the old Lola. You get an engine that you know works. Oh, wait, wait, wait. That's, a, that's for a Manuel. No, Piro. sorry. I'm sorry. Andrew is actually Amanda. down there. Let's find out what's going on. Andrew? Yes, I am. I'm with Gabriele. Uh, Raffinelli here. Big disappointment for you. Can they get the car out of there? Nah. He just hit the wall. Very noisy here, as you can hear. He went off and hit the wall, and we were just stuck in the wall, the car. Emmanuel in a speci driver. Yeah, yeah. Very big disappointment. The one consolation, the spaghetti's great. <laughs> okay, thank you very much. <laughs> He can uh, still laugh, guys. He can still laugh. That's fantastic. Yeah, he's a good one. Uh, yeah, that is so terribly frustrating. You can yeah, just see the frustration. He, he's, he's done so many 24-hour races. He, I talked to him last night for a long time. I had dinner with him. He, he had really high hopes. They've really yep. done their homework. They were on the pole at Silverstone. They've really been doing a very good job, and the car was quick. And they were hoping for a, a little bit of luck. You can see he's choking back the tears yeah. there. But I mean, he was a real good man at Sebring as well. He's a he's a real sportsman, that man, and uh, he knows what he's doing. It's a great shame, but that is just what can happen here at Le Mans. Everything's going fine. You need one slip up. Audi got away with us. Look at the mistake that Audi made with that number nine car yeah. in the lead. I mean, they to spin at Indianapolis, you're going some, and clout the barrier. Oh, it's amazing. And poor old Olive Garden goes off there at that reverse camber bend, biffs the wall, and he can't get it back to the pits. But just goes to show, we're six hours into a 24-hour race. There's a whole lot of racing going on, and a lot of things can happen. Absolutely. In fact, some of the best racing we talked about earlier is coming from the number eight Audi guy. It is number eight Audi guy, Tom Christensen. As you mentioned, only six hours in, but he's just set fast uh, lap of the race. He's going to be pretty happy with that. Uh, yes, but I mean, we have to catch up. I mean, as, as Le Mans throws something at us and I got in the car uh, where we were in fourth position, Frank was in fourth and it was not his fault. And uh, we just had to bring the car, try to bring the car to the front. And unfortunately, after three laps, uh, I hit a lot of debris after the crash and there was a pace car and the pace car, I did catch the wrong one and I lose two minutes because there's two pace cars here and I could just get thrown back. After I get loose again, I have a slow puncture because I hit the debris. I had to come in for tires. Is it too early? Is it too early in the race to be going that quick? Because by doing that quick lap, you actually did one less lap in your stint than it should have done. And that, of course, brings you in earlier for a pit stop. Uh, no, I didn't. I did exactly. I, if the two other stints, I've done more, one more lap than the others. So on that. So in that, that case, I've done more laps than the other, the other state, so I think we're going quite well. And uh, we have to catch up, and the race is still very young, and um, we're looking forward. Arms up. Now, what about the temperatures? We've had a huge drop in temperature in the last hour or so. Is that really helping with the tyres? Yeah, but that's the same for everybody, surely. I did. 
I did three stints in one set of tyres, and we'll keep doing that. We'll we have to catch up. All right, well, good luck to you. We'll keep an eye on you, Tom. Of course, Tom has got over 4,200 Michelin tyres here at his beck and call. As we work our way back, because just back here, we talked about Geordie Jean in the Volkswagen. Well, he has just brought that Volkswagen back into the pit area. When it left the pit, it left smoking. Geordie Jean is out of the car. Uh, you see him at the back of there, and they are going to work on this Volkswagen, the Rock Volkswagen, which is actually a firm favourite for the 675 class win. But now they are having a lengthy pit stop, and we'll try and find out more on that situation for you. Well, hopefully they'll be able to get that car backing out. And if you're in full chase mode, I'm not sure there's anybody else you want in your car than Tom Christensen. He is unbelievably quick. And here's another look at that moment that they were alluding to uh, when Artelli got away uh, and made it work. Obviously and sadly, the news not quite so good for a similar thing for the Rapinelli Lola. We'll be back. If there's still any doubt in your mind what the home of endurance racing is, listen to this. In 2001, Speed Vision will bring you the triple crown of endurance racing, the Rolex 24 Hours of Daytona, the 12 Hours of Sebring, and the 24 Hours of Le Mans in their entirety. I say again, in their entirety. That's right, no more trying to get internet updates in the middle of the night or waiting for TV coverage to resume. Next year, you can follow every hour of each of the big three endurance races live. And of course, that is only right here on Speed Vision. Uh, I believe that's our, uh, that's our all Canadian entry. That's our Canadian entry. And look how close they are. You think you could get it in on the, on the starter motor just to try to get it there so they can get to work. He's at the entrance, so he's coming down the entrance to the pit lane. Yeah, get out of the car and push it. Well, I, mean, I don't think you're allowed to do that anymore because uh, they've had some terrible accidents, people doing that. Junti was he, killed in the Buenos Aires race, uh, pushing but, his car to the pits once. But even in the pit lane, they can't push it? No, I'm not? no. Ah, okay. You know, they've got different rules at different places. We're, we're also coming to a very interesting time of the day, one of the most uh, incredible times right at that. Right. Oh, absolutely. We've got a very interesting story down in the pits. Andrew? David, just about to get in the car. He's going to three-stint it. He's going to three-stint it now. I can't hear you. Are you going to do a three stint now? I'm doing three stints. <laughs> You've got a lot of hard work to do. That looks like it. Okay, well, David Bradman, the car is almost here. Mario will get out, and David obviously can't hear us too well there, but uh, we'll wait for Mario to come and get up to you in the booth just for a few moments. We'll get it back down to you immediately upon his return to the pits. By the way, we are now a quarter of the way through the 68th running of the 24 hours of Le Mans. We are just past the six hour mark. It is uh, 10 minutes after 10 local time here. And as you can see, Danny, you were talking about this, the glinting of the sun and then punctuated by the headlights as it comes through. This is almost a magical time of night, isn't it? It is very much so. And if it's amazing to Americans that we are actually at 10 past 10 and it is still light here. Oh, yeah. We're so much further north and so much the, so much of the Americas that this is a pretty incredible. But what is fascinating here is that a lot of the guys have trouble at night. There's some people that just don't like to drive here in the night. And the difference between here and Daytona is our and Sebring is Daytona particularly is almost lit up. You can almost drive around that place with your lights out. Here, once you go out past Tat Rouge, it is pitch black dark, and there is nothing out there to let you know where you are. That's absolutely right. By the way, the leader is in. Laurent Aiello has brought the number nine Audi in, Guy. He's brought it in, brought it in very, very quickly, and they've gone straight away, of course, to the fueling. He's been offered a drink. He's not accepting it. He doesn't want it. And the, 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 the tire guys are getting ready, waiting for that fuel signal that they can actually go to work on the car. They can't do anything until all the fuel is in. 90 liters of fuel has got to go in. They're using Shell on the Audi this weekend. Off come the rear wheels, and on go the brand new set of Michelins. This looks like a pretty uh, tidy stop by these guys at the back, and they are going to change the front tires too, and they'll probably try and get three stints out of these as well. And up the front, we get one other guy who's allowed to work on the car. He's polishing away on the lights, trying to get those cleaned up, of course, get full of brake dust and dirt and mozzies. And now this thing is set and ready to go, refired, and Lauren Aiello is back out on the track. And he had a seven second lead when he came in. Obviously, he's going to have a little bit of a deficit. But also, there's some pretty interesting lap boards here. And it seems that not everyone is agreeing in Audi about how far behind each one is. We'll check on that story for you in a bit. Get another look at the, uh, the Maxwell, the Canadian entry. 
And uh, that tonight, we also saw just how thorough this Audi team is. They're aware of this may be electronic timing and scoring, but there's a hand done on it as well. They polished up that number. They want timing and scoring to know just where they are. Yeah, that's very critical around here. You don't want any mistakes and try to argue it on Monday morning. You got to win it on Sunday afternoon. Don't forget, you have Reinhold Yost running that team. He's got a, a hell of a record here at Le Mans. Let's go right back down. Andrew Mario is in. Yeah, Mario is in, and uh, his eyes actually out on stops, I have to say. And uh, now David Fraven climbs aboard. Mario is helping him. Mario, of course, in the famous uh, mauve and silver helmet. And uh, we've seen that, of course, on a number of Andres. Mario looked. Mario looks fairly calm here. The fuel has gone in. They're going to put uh, tyres on. As you heard, David uh, grab and play. He's now going to triple stitch his car. Mario walks back into the garage. The familiar figure we've seen over so many years. And meanwhile, this car is going to fire up in just a second. The big uh, Ford V8 engine. Remember, of course, that Panos are having new engines built next year. They have a complete new car with a Zytec engine. I am told the uh, car will still be in front engine. Here it fire up now. Off it goes. And I'm going to try and get in the garage and see if I can get a hold of Mario. But uh, back to you in the booth for a moment. All right, thanks very much, Andrew. And David Brabham, uh, we saw he led this race earlier, and uh, it wasn't all that easy for the Audis to work their way by. We may just have a race afoot uh, in just a few minutes here. When we do come back, as Andrew said, we'll try and get a word with Mario Andretti. Welcome back. The number 63 Goodrich Service Plus Corvette uh, is undergoing its stop. Driver change and fueling has been completed. Looks like they're making a change to the rear wing angle on that car as well. Uh, is that... Uh well, if what they what they said on this car earlier is they had a problem with the undertray and the car was loose. Remember when we interviewed Ron Fellows? Right. And he said the car was loose. Well, as the track right now gets cooler, there gets more grip. Before, he said it actually helped him because the front end slid, so it kind of balanced the car. As he gets more grip on the front, the rear is going to go loose. They've got to adjust that rear wing to counterbalance that. And that car now makes its way back out. It has uh, pretty consistently been the leader of the two Corvettes in their uh, sort of cat and mouse game. They've uh, occasionally dipped into the top three in class. Most of the time they've been fourth and fifth, but never that far back. And they are out. Now, take a look at this shot. And obviously, uh, the lights ablaze here. It's actually a little darker, perhaps, than the cameras let on. And we talked about this being a magical time of night, but it also has to be a somewhat difficult time of night for a driver uh, who's been out there for a while in better daylight. Yeah, that's absolutely right. There's a definite transition period. And as you so rightly say, it looks pretty bright and daylight-ish out there at the moment. That's because the television cameras have light-enhancing properties, as we all know from our camcorders and stuff. It's quite tricky out there at the moment. That's a brake disc, by the way, glowing uh, super red hot. As Carbon it comes fiber. Into, uh, yeah, it comes Carbon into our marsh. But a driver has to definitely switch from using his eyeballs on natural light to using his eyeballs with tungsten light, with uh, halogen light that these guys are using now. It's quite a tricky period, and uh, sometimes people get it wrong. Stop there by the number 12. That's uh, the Panos Motorsports, uh, Panos Roadster Ford, and I believe that's Hiroki Kato uh, getting back behind the wheel. He had a pretty impressive opening uh, stint as well, so uh, turning that car over. Now up on the Jackson, going after the tires on that machine. And uh, that car is uh, right there in fifth. That is uh, just a lap down to the, the cars that are running uh, in the top four spots right now. So uh, a good effort there, but that's one of the one of the of the of the things with Lamar you were talking about adjusting to the changes and of course Danny you mentioned earlier the general lack of light is a fairly high-tech dash on that roadster uh, as he guides it back out onto the track this track throws an awful lot at you uh, in terms of, uh, of uh, obstacles in a way well it does and let's remember one thing you know these have great headlights on these cars I mean they do a fantastic job but when you're traveling at speeds over 200 miles an hour there's very few headlights that'll keep up with that and they're darting around my my idea always was that the track hasn't gone anywhere from when the daylight was out till when the nighttime came so you had to kind of pick out points around the track as markers to trust that you could go from from with those and we've got word now andrew you have found mario andretti yeah i have got mario andretti here mario an hour and a half seat time there did you enjoy yourself well it's uh bit of a learning curve with the car because uh you know i hadn't i didn't have much time in it and uh uh the first go we didn't get the belt tight i was bouncing all over the place and then uh 
you know, then from there, you know, we're just riding, you know, the second set of, the same set of tires. Uh, I'm not totally happy yet, you know, with myself, uh, you know, we'll, I think probably the next go round should be a lot better, you know, get a chance to think about it. Um, it was just, uh, we needed more miles during practice, but, you know, we had other problems, so, you know, I didn't get it, but, um, you know, if the thing stays together, we're, we got plenty of time. Still enjoying the magic at the moment of Le Mans, though. Of course. Mario, well done. Catch up with you later. Thank you. Well, Danny, you mentioned earlier, of course, that uh, the other drivers in that car drive it for a living, drive it constantly, test it. Uh, so, Mario, the learning curve, I would suspect, is indeed rather steep. And these headlights are incredibly bright, so bright you could probably use them to land a plane, and that kind of gives this track sometimes the look of a runway, perhaps. And <laughs> are you trying to get out of it? I'm trying to get out of it. That was out. actually an airstrip you were talking about. <laughs> that wasn't a darkening track. I don't know if I want you driving my car at night. You have a memory, man. That was 15 minutes ago, and you're still on me about that. <laughs> All right. Well, we're going to take a break. Lord knows I need one. And uh, we'll be back with uh, Danny Sullivan here in the booth <laughs> in just a minute or two. we got to give him some stick. Welcome back once again to uh, Le Mans as we are about six hours and 20 minutes into this event. And again, that's only a quarter of the way. This race goes on a full 24 hours. And as a result, to hustle a car around here at 200 plus miles an hour, driver comfort and making sure they're well rested and revived is important. And earlier, Guy Hobbs took a look at the high tech approach to that here at Le Mans. Not only is it important to be comfortable in the car during the 24 hours of Le Mans, but also out of the cars. The guys have to relax and unwind. And here at Audi Sport, they're provided with some fine cabins where they can get time to relax and take a nap. We had the chance to tour one of them, Ronaldo Capello, who is teammate and roommate to Michele Alvaretto. This is our nice room for the 24 hour of Le Mans. It's a very good container <laughs> with two beds where uh, the driver can uh, lay down uh, and uh, if it's possible to sleep a little bit. It's not so clean at the moment, and uh, also the two beds are not uh, are not made, but uh, we will make it in uh, in few hours. The most important uh, thing uh, in a very long distance race like Le Mans, because after uh, three hours on the car, you can uh, after the massage you you can take a shower and uh, lay down on the bed uh, a little bit. I think it's not so big, but it's enough for uh, for one night. Uh, was <laughs> now my teammate is coming, <laughs> Mikel is coming, and uh, <laughs> I was explaining our very nice uh, room for the 24 hour I race. It was in a uh, medium hotel in the middle of Italy, yes? <laughs> <laughs> and not very cheap hotel. Right? Not very cheap. Yeah. So as you can see, the Audi Sport team, Yoast team, has spared no expense. With the four cabins for all the drivers, the spare parts truck, and also the huge garage area they have built behind the pit lane. Now, well, not every team has the same budget as Audi Sport. And as you can see, there's quite the contrary to the team next door, just the one caravan. That's the WR team that's uh, running in the LMP 675 class, and they're no less serious about it, just different budget. Well, I have to empathize with them because when I used to come here, we never had a caravan. I think we had a few old cardboard boxes around. We used to sort of have a sleep under those. And uh, someone used to come along and your massage was being kicked out the way. That's the only massage <laughs> oh, we yeah. ever got. <laughs> but you know what's unique is they haven't just done it here. You know, Audi right across the other side of that aerodrome that you were talking about, where the exposition center is, they took over one of the buildings over there. And it's a 500-room hotel that they put the press and their guests and so forth in there. It has plumbing. Everybody's got their own little room similar to what they had right there. But it's a 500 Michelin has one right behind there that yes. sleeps about 350. And I then just in that. case you're a VIP and you're not happy with your seat on the screen, we're showing you that's the Audi Tower. And folks, what it does, there is a circular platform with nothing but but seats that you clamp down into, takes you up about 100 or so feet in the air and gives you an unbelievable view here. It is fantastic. In fact, one of the things we should say is that's where we need to send you on your break for your birthday. Because your birthday's today as well, aren't yes. it? Yes. You didn't tell us that. We'll, we'll you just didn't focus on, on Jessica Capello's And how, how old is this? I mean, are we, should we guess? Or is this... Uh, Do we really have to get into this? Uh, 43. Well, 43 years old. And 
Oh, I'm like glad, we're gonna feel glad, for you. I'm glad you're not giving me any any slack here, though. That's that's, that's old enough to, to be Capella's father. Oh, now that hurt. <laughs> hey, I didn't Very say much. that. That was that was all down to Alan. Boy, I'll tell you. By the way, the, mentioning the massage aspect, that's another thing. The physios, as as they call them here, these teams have have i mean it's chiropractic special it's unbelievable what they have to work these drivers over prior to and they after need them yeah. they but need them you get beaten up quite badly we've seen how little suspension travel is yeah. on these cars in fact on the audi probably the only real suspension you've got is the side wall of the tire flexing a little bit so these guys get beaten up and we all know we saw at sebring for instance uh, later and all those other drivers all out there with bandaged wrists all right well that's sebring but even here at le mans you've got to really look after yourself and you need people to help you do it as well and let's think about it for all the money that we saw right there that Audi's spending and and other manufacturers they're not the only one that's doing that sort of deal volkswagen has a huge center here in the back as oh, yeah. well so and toyota's done it in the past and mercedes and porsche and everybody else is it not right to go and do something to make sure that the drivers are in good physical condition to do their job, that they're fed properly with the right foods as opposed to just anything to make sure that they can perform? You're spending all that money. You shouldn't let it down in that division. That's right. Well, they have professional people doing that. They have dietitians. This has all become so super professional now that like every other professional sportsman, sports person, they have professionals looking after them, telling them what to eat, what to drink, when to sleep, and what to sustain their diet with. Well, and after a three-hour stint in the car, it probably feels awful good to come by and have somebody crack the back just a little bit and uh, give you an opportunity to relax. It is now officially dark here at Lama. We will be right back. That's some great racing. And now let's head down to the pits in Andrew Marriott for our Cadillac update. Yes, we're here for the Cadillac update, and Andy Wallace has just come in. He's, this is going to be a very quick stop. They just put fuel in the car. The lights have now gone, and Andy accelerates away. The North Star system engine sounding absolutely great. Heading back out on track, remember, you can follow all the activity of Cadillac and the Corvettes as well at GM.com, and they have some great stuff. And they have a thing in this car called night vision, and it's something that they're working on, certainly for their road cars, but they're using a bit of an application here in their in their uh, uh, their racing as well working to perfect it just a little bit and that is something that has been a while in developing cadillac is very intense on making this program work a three-year commitment for the racing program but it didn't just start here at lama a little bit earlier i took a look at that in early 1997, Cadillac began planning a notice to the world that it was about to deliver on its promise of a new global technology. With Herb Fischel and GM Race Shop, it was secretly decided that the international stage of Le Mans was the place to showcase Cadillac's new art and science positioning. At the 1999 Geneva Auto Show, Cadillac made it official, announcing they would indeed compete in the 24-hour classic in June of 2000. With that challenge before them, Cadillac enlisted the proven experience of world-renowned race car engineers Bob Riley and Mark Scott. Established in 1990, Riley and Scott were eager to once again apply their design, fabrication, and development expertise towards conquering the world's premier endurance test. With wins here at the 12 Hours of Sebring and the Rolex 24 Daytona, Cadillac is quite confident in their partnership with Riley and Scott. As the initial plans for the Cadillac Northstar Le Mans prototype began to take shape, Riley and Scott engineers used computer-aided design technology to create potential design platforms. The most promising of these then came to life in the form of scale models built for use in wind tunnel studies at both the GM Aerodynamics Laboratory and Swift Engineering. Hours of wind tunnel testing and reams of data later, a shape evolved which was deemed the most effective tool for the task at hand, victory. By March of 1999, design was well underway, but ACO approval of a new, far more aerodynamic single roll hoop, as on the BMW and the Panos prototypes, made it clear a large-scale bodywork redesign incorporating this feature would be required. This change proved no small feat, but the engineers were up to the challenge. In the meantime, it was known that the power plant would be the 4-liter North Star V8. The question was induction, atmospheric or turbo? For the answer, GM called on longtime partner turbocharging experts McLaren Engines. Parallel engineering studies yielded horsepower and fuel economy results highly favoring a turbo. And by February of 99, GM decided that turbo it would be, twin turbo actually, and dyno development was underway. As for the chassis, the Cadillac Northstar LMP is a full carbon monocoque construction. 
Riley and Scott began the build process with the formation of bucks or wooden replicas of the final components. From these bucks, the molds were then created. Epoxy impregnated carbon fiber strips were next hand laid into the mold and finally extreme heat and pressure were applied in the autoclave baking and curing the material. Once fabrication of components was complete, assembly began. The bare carbon monocoque received its North Star V8 power plant and six-speed sequential transaxle, both fully stressed chassis members. Careful assembly continued until exacting tolerances for fit were met. Finally, on a cool, late September morning, somewhere among the cornfields of Indiana, the moment of truth had arrived. Ron Fellows would pilot chassis 001, the first of the Cadillac North Star LMPs. The maiden voyage was at hand. Initial shakedown results proved very encouraging, and further development and refinement would continue in GM's wind tunnel before the race debut. And then that debut came, and it came at none other than this year's Rolex 24 at Daytona, a challenge the two Cadillac North Star LMPs proved well prepared to tackle, finishing second and third in class. Well, we still can't help but wonder, Cadillac on the racetrack? Well, Cadillac has been working for, for a number of months to to reposition themselves. And I think that that was accelerated as they became more of a globally focused company. That car is symbolic of change. It, it's dynamic, it's robust, it's innovative, it's creative, it's artistic. That's what the Cadillac program's all about. Two of the remaining Cadillacs, in fact, are still in the top 15. And according to no, no less an endurance expert than Andy Wallace, the program is very much on track. There is the Olive Garden Raffinelli Lola Judd that has now been able to make its way back into the paddock for repair. The crowd here at Le Mans remains immense and enthused about the action on the track. And of course, for more on the story with Cadillac, let's go back down to Andrew. Yeah, well, I got the project manager, Jeff Ketman here. Jeff, you've worked for two years for this day and night. So how are you feeling right now? Well, it's still early. We're just a little past a quarter of the way, and we've had quite a bit of bad luck already. We had a puncher and blew up a lot of body work on that. So hopefully we've used up our bad luck, and now we've only got good luck left. Is this program really changing the image of Cadillac? We certainly hope so, and I think it has just the general feedback that we've had from the people on the street is about Cadillac uh, being excited that they're here and a, a definite change in the perception of what they think of them. Jeff, it's now got to be night. Are you going to use that, that night sight on the front of the car? Does that work? Yes, actually, we've had it on since the beginning, and uh, they've checked it out, and everything seems to be working fine. So keep running it, and the drivers have their selection as to whether or not they need to use it. If it gets really foggy, it could be an advantage. Yes, hopefully we'll get a chance here in about another eight hours to see that. Jeff, Kevin, thanks very much. Thanks. Well, truly a great example of uh, developing something in racing and perfecting something in racing that has great application on the road. Pretty fascinating program. But to finish the, uh, the caddy story, to make your debut, two 24-hour races is truly a baptism under fire. They're great boys, I have to say. I really, really admire them because you take hold of that image that Cadillac have had over the years, which is a great image anyway, and make it sporting and bring it back up to date, which is obviously what they're trying to do. I believe they are succeeding. I'm not surprised they've got a good feedback from general public, from people in motor racing as well, because what they're doing, it's a, it's a brave effort and it's working for them. And to take a car more or less straight out of the box to a 24-hour race and run it and come in, finish second and third in your class is a phenomenal effort. And to come to Le Mans and actually uh, start and finish here first time round is also fantastic. Well, we have to think of one thing, too. These guys, with the smart commitment that they made, was it's a minimum of a three-year program, yeah. and that's what you have to do. Audi didn't succeed their first year. Toyota spent all the time and money and made a great effort, but they didn't succeed. They had the best of a second. It just takes time. When BMW, their first year was a disaster, the second year they came back and dominated. It's just one of those things. It takes time to win, develop that. We've talked about the Vipers. Yeah. Look at that team, team down there. Are you saying they're doing it right? 
they have a winning tradition. They've made that thing winning. They've gotten into the groove of winning. Now they know how to do it. Cadillac well, has right. to do the but, same thing. Sure. But similarly, you know, the Corvettes, when you think about it, this is their first time they've been here. Last time a Corvette came here was probably Greenwood all those years ago. I mean, that thing went like a dingbat on the straight, 211 miles an hour, but it wasn't much good around the corners. What Corvette have done here is to produce a brand new car straight out the box, and look how competitive they are. I mean, they're on the same lap as these Chryslers. Fantastic. The highest placed of the uh, three Cadillacs still running, the number three dams entry is down the pits. Andrew? Yes, it is, with Emmanuelle Collard staying in the car. I'm not sure if they're going to change these uh, tyres right now, these Pirellis. Some work going on in the cockpit I can't quite work out. It's, it, it, no, I know what it is. They're just waiting to unplug the uh, downloading the computer, so they're just uh, unloading all the data. The guy standing right with me here with his laptop at the ready. The car fires up again, and they still haven't unplugged this uh, lead, but obviously getting all the very latest information from the car. It's a motor racing, so uh, technologically brilliant these days. And uh, the car's still firing up, and I'm not quite sure why this is not going. The board says on it, ignition on, pump on, lights on, fuel reset, pit lane, speed set. And now it is finally all ready to go, and off it goes. And that's the damn scout with Eric. Sorry, not Eric. Uh, Manuel Collard at the wheel. Well, and that computer information in the download is uh, so important, especially for a team in the development phase. And, uh, you know, I mentioned earlier that Andy Wallace said that this team was on track. Remember, he ran with Audi last year. And you look at the success of Audi right now, and Andy Wallace says that actually he thinks the Caddy program might be just a little bit ahead of where Audi was last year. So uh, that's uh, some pretty serious praise and maybe not a little bit of pressure indeed. As uh, we watch the cars circulating through the night, the activity in the pits under the artificial light as well. We're going to step away from Le Mans for just a moment here. We'll be back at this glorious circuit now in darkness. Unbelievably glorious moon. Unfortunately, in the uh, Raffinelli garage, Guy, things a bit more fraught. Uh, very fraught down here. I'm with Gabrielle Raffinelli right now. They just brought the car in. It actually made it back here at 10.35, so it's been in for about 10 minutes now. A lot of damage to the front end of that car, and obviously no front end. Took him a long time to get back around. He lost 12 laps out on the track. What, can you, what, are the, what does the future hold? We are used to this type of accident. We are working very hard. We are getting on his feet as soon as possible. We'll go out there as fast as we can and as quick as we can. Now, everybody says if you can have a problem in a 24-hour race, have it early. We're still pretty early into this 24-hour event. Well, that's why we believe in that. And um, even for all our fans in America, they are watching us on television, telling them we'll be, we will be back out there and we'll be quick again. And we'll bring the car to the finish. Fast and, I'm sorry, not better than accident. That's where life is. Do you have any real, like, realistic idea how long you're going to be stuck in the garage here? No, the damage is pretty big, but we can repair it. When the car goes out, it's going to be perfect. Give us 25 minutes, we'll be out there. All right, they've got 25 minutes. You can get fresh bread at the Olive Garden for 25 minutes. A lot of damage to the right front suspension. Oh, Gabriel's going to come back. Maybe quicker. Maybe quicker. All right. Left front suspension has damaged a huge amount of vegetation underneath the uh, uh, underneath the front of the car. I understand there's trouble for the Cadillac, because I just saw Wayne Taylor pull into the pit. Maybe Andrew Marriott's down there. Well, there are problems, certainly. They've been working on this wheel for quite some time. And, uh, oh, it is, there's something wrong. That is yeah. towed out badly. Uh, maybe it's something with the, with the uh, locating lugs, because that, that wheel maybe is just not going on. No, I think he's bent something there. I think something's bent and that wheel is not coming off because it's, uh, it's, it's distorted. Yeah, it looks like some piece of suspension maybe is a muck yeah. back there. That's why they're hammering inside. Yeah. But Let's I go back down we'll to Guy. Do he's there. Back down at the, uh, the Cadillac area. The right front is heavily getting bashed on by a very heavy hammer right now. Obviously, a bent uh, shaft there. They can't get that wheel off. And we're getting a lot of debris. Let's see if we can get a better angle, better shot away here. Three guys, actually four guys, working on that right now. Looks like they got, oh, there he goes. Looks like they broke something loose just then. And now they're going to get that right rear off. Guys, nice. didn't they have a similar problem at Daytona? Yeah, I think that's exactly right. They didn't have a precisely that problem. He's, he's yeah. clouted something there. Well, I think. at least they've had practice then at doing this. Yeah, exactly. But that's in a very difficult area, and it looks like they can't go underneath the back of the car and come in from the other side, so they can only attack it from the outside. And yeah. they're basically attacking it with a big hammer, 
and a big wrench. What that means also is that when they get it off, they're going to have to repair whatever and change the damage that they're doing right now. So they do have some work in front of them. Yeah. And they got to do it with a limited number of people because they are working outside in pit lane. They have not got this car into its garage. They haven't. They couldn't get it inside. I guess it wouldn't push well, around. Well, yes, but with three guys, you put it on a quick lift jack, spin the back in, and pull it in the garage. But I, they probably think they can get it done without doing that. Well, could be, but look, it's taken some time just to get it off. I mean, yeah. just to get the wheel off, let alone repair it. Well, you know, and at Daytona, they ran steel brakes, and they thought when they went to the carbon brakes for this event that that might eliminate the wheel problem they were having. Whether or not it's, it's related, there certainly is a problem. And Andrew, the number 17, Courage is in. Yes, and Philip Gash is at the wheel. This is just a... <laughs> So a wonderful John engine screaming as it goes out. Interesting engine is because Philip Cash is also the team owner as well as one of the prime drivers. But he went so well early in the race, didn't he? Extremely well, so except he had that one spin. But uh, once that occurred, they were able to just go. And you're taking a look. It looks like they have a rotor assembly ready to go. And that uh, looks awfully similar to the problems they experienced at Daytona. And uh, this is going to be, as you said, a longest fix. Yeah, that's the whole back end they got there with the, um, uh, the upright, the rotor, the whole nine yards they got to put on there. One other observation while this is going on in the pits that I've noticed since it's gone dark, uh, the lap times have dropped off a couple of seconds, two, three seconds. But I expect as everybody gets acclimated to that darkness and they get used to where everything is in the track and the track cools down a little bit more, those lap times will drop and get more back to where they were running in yeah. the daytime. You know, the Olive Garden guy is, is really the very, very best example of a Le Mans entrant. I mean, he is such a sporting man. He's was choking back the tears one minute saying that's the end of it which it looked like it was. The car comes back into the pits there. They pull it in the garage. The thing's basically written off and destroyed. Oh, no, he says, 25 minutes, we're going to... I, I love that man, you know. That is the spirit of Le Mans. That's what brings a man to Le Mans to race. Oh, indeed, and we certainly hope the Cadillac gets its problems taken care of. But if they get the Olive Garden Raffinelli Lola repair, gents, dinner might still be on. We'll be right back. Well, gentlemen, as you suspected, this is going to be a bit of a longer fix. They have pushed the number one Cadillac back into the garage, so that allows them, uh, look at that, they are seriously getting after it. That allows them virtually unlimited numbers of mechanics to work on. Yes, and also access to the kind of tools we can see them there. Look, a pneumatic grinder. I mean, they are actually going for it. This has got some serious problems. I rather think, looking at it, that the wheel has chafed away on its, uh, on its stub axle there and or something's broken, but hey, whatever. Just like in the spirit of Le Mans, just like the Olive Gardens, they will fix this car, it will be back out there. The driver hasn't even had to get out of it. So they'll sort it out and they'll pack him off out there. And the race is still young. It's, what, not even seven hours old yet. Well, you know, you have a major problem by a, a car up front. You can lose a humongous number of laps and uh, the complexion can certainly change in a hurry. And that is the number one car that, that if, if <laughs> It almost seems that this team, with the exception, of course, of the Dams car that, uh, uh, that burned earlier, that all of the problems are befalling the number one car. The, the number uh, uh, three entry sits comfortably in the top six. The, the other entry sits comfortably in the uh, top 17, 18. So things going very well uh, in many ways for that team. Now, you know what? You see the Ferris wheel circulating there on the outside of the track past the Dunlop Bridge over by the S's. Well, that is something special about Le Mans. It's not just a race. It's an event. And who better to take a look at that than Steve Evans? Anytime you have an eight and a half mile racetrack, you've got one huge infield and exploring here at Le Mans is amazing. This is an area called the village and it's just that. It's shops and it's tents, it's champagne, it's designer clothes. Corvette has a huge deal over here that people don't miss a thing because right there is our broadcast on this huge big screen. And all in all, I'll tell you this place is, there's gotta be 10 or 15,000 people just in the village area right now. A tiny fraction of the infield here at Le Mans. Let's do some more exploring. I'll be back later. Well, there is certainly an awful lot to explore here, and uh, Steve's awful good at that. Vanderpool patiently waiting inside the car. It's going to be a bit of a long repair. I wanted to touch on something here. As I mentioned, it, it is now very dark here. The temperature has dropped off noticeably. The track temperature is dropping as well. All the tire suppliers, and there are some six of them here, have no doubt brought some softer compounds for use in the night. 
are they going to start going to those tires now, and will they still be able to do the super long triple stinting if they need to? Quite well, possibly, yeah, because as you said, as the track temperature drops, then softer rubber will keep up the adhesion that you need. The other important thing to remember is that as the temperature of the ambient air drops, so the charge of fuel-air mixture that goes into the engine is heavier. Because it's heavier, it has more calorific value. In other words, you get more horsepower. Always at Le Mans, your car is quickest down the straights at night, which is why you have night practice here. Obviously, you have to gear the car so that you don't over-rev it at night. Because if you gear it during the day, you could over-rev at night. And uh, there's one or two teams that have come here in the past and blown up at night because they were over-revving on the straight. There's also, of course, the factor that at night when it gets cooler, you get heavier, you get more downforce. The air gets a little bit heavier, especially if there's any moisture at all in that air. But now let's take one other thing into consideration. These guys, when they're checking those tires, they will make that determination if they already haven't made it from the night practice uh, that they did previously during the week. So the tire guys are up on top of it, and they'll determine, see, if the tire, for example, is faster, is it faster enough to leave it on for, for three stops, or will it go off enough? Or if they have to change it after two, is it better to go with this harder compound so they can go three stops? That's exactly right. It's all down to temperature, really, because if the tar can maintain its working temperature where it's giving grip, they'll leave them on. If the tar's running too cold, hey, they'll change it for something softer. Well, and also, we talked to the Michelin people earlier, and they said every tire that comes off a car goes right back to their main transporter, where they have engineers on site that literally give it an autopsy of sorts. They, they dissect it to find out exactly what that tire is doing, and by that, they can give you immediate feedback That's right. what's going on. Not, they have 23 runners here, Michelin, but they brought 4,500 tires with them. They've got every conceivable combination you could want. And it comes down to another factor, which is it might work on one car that it doesn't work on another. A lot is the setup of a car, the way that people are driving the car. Those are other factors they have to take into consideration. That's true. Let me jump down uh, to Andrew Marriott. He was just there for the stop. Uh, I believe Guy Smith was in, Andrew. Yes, Guy Smith was in the car. He stayed in the car. Interesting story here. The guy who holds the board, the team manager, is John Wickham. Now, John Wickham was the team manager of the Spirit Honda that Stefan Johansson drove. Wine back 20 years, was it? Formula One, remember when Honda made a comeback? John Wickham and Stefan Johansson have been working together off and on for 20 years. It's nice to have combinations like that down in the pit lane at Le Mans. There's also an interesting thing about John Wickham. John Wickham ran the British, the John Lloyd Audi team last year here at Le Mans. A lot of history here, certainly, and uh, it's amazing how it seems to sometimes fold place and time together and bring old friends together as well.